Um, so I am, uh, I, my name is Michelle Walker OMB. I'm the Assistant Commissioner for the Office of Policy and Planning at TDAC. And um, I'm going to go through and hopefully take you into the minds a little bit of air regulators. Um, our air regulators across the country are going to be the folks that will be responsible for putting these plans together and getting them reviewed and approved by EPA. They have experience doing this. They do the traditional national ambient air quality state implementation plans. So they've done it before in a different context. And a lot of what I'll talk about uh, will give you kind of a, a, a little bit of an insight, hopefully, as to what questions they're asking um, when they hear about demand side uh, reductions and the possibilities in that context. And let me just caveat this. All the information I've included is what's in the proposal. So we're still waiting on a final rule. Um, we're hoping that it's going to have some more clarity. States uh, ad advocated very much to EPA that we need more clarity on the state plan considerations, what can and cannot be included, how it needs to be included. So a lot of these will be comments based off on the proposal. And we're hoping we're going to get some additional clarity in the final rule. So just starting a little bit, I wanted to give you guys a backdrop of the time frame we're under. Um, we've heard EPA plans to issue the final rule in the summer of 2015. That would be this summer. We were originally promised June. Um, it now looks like July or August, question mark. Um, we're hoping it's not September or October <laughs> or November, uh, because as of right now, EPA is still saying that uh, the summer 2016 is the plan date when states actually have to have their initial, at least their initial plans into EPA. Um, the other thing that EPA promised us we were going to get this summer is what a proposed federal plan looks like. For those of y'all who don't live in the Clean Air Act, um, a federal plan is what EPA would put in place or could put in place if a state refuse to put a state implementation plan in place or put an inadequate state implementation plan in place. So getting to look at what a proposed federal plan looks like um, is going to be important in a lot of contexts because it will give the public and states an idea of what could be the result if a state plan was not adequate. Um, summer 2016, next summer, uh, we have to submit a, uh, our initial compliance plan. I'm calling it initial compliance plan because if you read any of the state comments that went in on the proposal, most states across the country have said that a year time period, now maybe less than a year time period, is going to be really difficult to get a final implementation plan in place. So they would need an additional extended year. EPA has responded favorably to that and has said that you could put in an initial plan in summer 2016 and request a one year extension to put in your final plan if you are an individual state doing an individual state plan. Or you could put in a two-year request for an extension um, if you were working with other states to do a multi-state plan. And the reason for that on our, our state comments is that in Tennessee, we estimate that even if we, uh, when we're talking about a regulatory SIP, which means a SIP that involves us um, either revising or adding new rules, we have about a 9 to 12-month estimated time period of what we need to get that done. And that really, you know, has everything to do with our state regulatory process, the, uh, the public participation requirements that are associated with our state regulatory process, and then, of course, going before our legislature and the Government Operations Committee. So I wanted to um, just give you guys a look. I know you heard this morning, had some great presentations on the rule. Um, demand side reduction, and, and I highlighted building block four. That's where it falls into the clean power plan. If you count um, renewable as part of demand side reduction, you would also have a part of building block three that would be included. So in Tennessee, this is what our baseline emissions look like uh, based on EPA's calculations under the proposal. And our interim uh, CO2 performance goal in pounds per megawatt hour is 1254. And our final is 1163. And uh, this stair step chart just kind of shows you where EPA thinks that we could get the reductions in Tennessee. And if you see, the predominant portion of those reductions are coming from step 4A. And that means we're applying the nuclear component. That's our under construction nuclear and at risk nuclear. Um, and the predominant portion of that is really from the construction of Watts Bar. So at the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, we've been, as you all can imagine, we've been looking at this and planning for a while. 
around uh, not only doing comments to EPA for the rule proposal, but now looking at what we could potentially do with a implementation plan. Um, we've got a number of different folks within the division that are taking a look at this. Uh, our Division of Air Pollution Control, which is the division that will be responsible for finalizing and putting together the plan, is uh, heavily involved. Those are our technical staff. Um, the Office of Policy and Planning, which I lead, our Office of Energy of Programs, um, and also our Office of General Counsel. Other entities that we are closely engaged with and have been in conversations with are our Tennessee Air Pollution Control Board. They will be the actual regulatory authority in Tennessee that will have to approve any regulations that we choose to either revise or, um, or implement as a part of this plan. The Tennessee Regulatory Authority, as you all might have heard, uh, Tennessee, the TRA in Tennessee, um, because of the uniqueness of TVA, having about 99.7% of our uh, electric producing capacity, um, TRA doesn't actively regulate in this area. They have a small portion up in uh, northeastern Tennessee where we have AEP power that provides electric power. They don't actually have any affected units in the state, though. But the TRA is obviously very interested in this, and so we've been keeping them um, involved and engaged as well. And uh, not last, but certainly not least, obviously, is the Tennessee Valley Authority, which is, um, for Tennessee, the major, major uh, uh, regulated entity when it comes to the Clean Power Plan. So um, before we get into the demand side reduction, specific considerations and questions that we are pondering and pontificating these days, um, I wanted to go back and just remind folks of the overall plan considerations that state regulators have to grapple with as well. Um, our goals are obviously rate-based goals. They were given to us as rate-based goals. States have the choice to convert those into a mass-based equivalent. So uh, states across the country, Tennessee is included in that, are still grappling with whether or not we stick with rate-based goals or we go with a mass-based equivalent. Um, how to do that, how to calculate that is, is predominantly taking up the time of our technical folks. Uh, the other question that we're asking is, do we just go with a state-established emission standard, a set of standards, or other measures? Um, and we'll get into, I'll use the term other measures a lot, um, but we'll, we'll get into the concept of, of what this means. Inherently, it's the simplicity of saying the state of Tennessee would tell TVA, here's your emission rate at your affected units. You have to comply. Tell us how you're going to comply throughout the compliance period. That's one way of approaching a plan. The other way of approaching the plan is to say, here's some rates or a mass-based cap, and you tell us how you're going to comply, but that doesn't actually equate to the full version of what we have to do in Tennessee. And so for that other portion, there could be other measures that we could be relying on to get those additional emission reductions. Um, that ties in closely with who are your responsible parties under the plan. If uh, in, in, in the state of Tennessee, it's actually, we're a little bit lucky in that our responsible party, if we go with an EGU only plan, which means TVA will be the only person we'll be talking to, um, it gets pretty simple. We just put the rate on the units and, uh, and that's it. If we include other measures, um, it gets a little more complicated. Uh, who those responsible parties are and what will be their responsibilities under the plan will be uh, considerations that we have to have to take into account. Um, the other options are individual state plan. Do you go it alone? Do you do a multi-state plan? Do you do a cooperative or trading ready plan? I actually left out individual state plan because there's a little bit of a joke going on among air regulators and that the utility industry doesn't and, and our electric system defies state boundaries. And so in concept, no plan is really going to be an individual state plan. Um, you're going to have to have a conversation at some point with other states around you. So for us, it really is just a multi-state cooperative or trading ready plan. Um, regionally, we've had a lot of discussions about the concept of a trading ready plan because we don't exist in a region that has a trading infrastructure already set up like our Reggie states in the Northeast or California in the West. Um, so the question the air regulators are asking is, what does a plan look like that we could get done within the time frame that EPA has allotted us that would allow trading but doesn't necessarily have everything figured out from day one? So the two other things that I wanted to go over is this note on a plan with a state commitment. Um, there are two different approaches for plans 
that would include these other measures. And these other measures are really getting that inclusion of energy efficiency programs or other programs. The two different approaches that EPA refers to are one a portfolio approach and the other is a state commitment approach. In a portfolio approach, you have enforceable measures that are put on the affected uh, the electric generating units, EGUs. Um, but you also have enforceable measures against other entities. And so from a state perspective and from EPA's perspective, because you've got enforceable measures in the plan on both the other entities and the affected EGUs, every measure in the plan becomes federally enforceable because it's included in the state plan. The only way to avoid that is to do what we call a state commitment approach or what EPA is calling a state commitment approach. And those kind of plans are where you include enforceable measures on the affected EGUs. That would be a rate or a mass cap on your um, EGUs and then a state commitment. And what EPA is calling a state commitment is simply an enforceable commitment by the state that all the other measures that it doesn't want to include in the plan other energy efficiency measures, other type of reduction measures um, it, that it didn't want to include in the plan because it doesn't want to make them federally enforceable, the state will take the commitment that they will meet those emission reductions. What that means, <laughs> and, and importantly, um, there are a lot of folks that are, that are debating this right now, what, what that's been interpreted to mean based on what EPA has said is that if the state programs or the other measures fail to achieve the expected emission reductions, the state could be subject to challenge, including lawsuits by third parties, uh, for violating Clean Air Act requirements and could be held liable uh, and given Clean Air Act penalties. So you've got a lot of discussion amongst attorney general offices across the country now about whether or not a state can actually enter into a plan with a state commitment because it may be deemed a, a waiver of state sovereign immunity. Um, so that is an entire legal debate that's going on. Air regulators, regulators are engaged with wanting to understand what the answer will be. Um, and it really is a state-by-state -state, uh, determination from the AG's office in that particular state about whether that would be an acceptable approach under the state plan. The reason I bring that up is because when we bring energy efficiency and other demand side reduction programs into the context of the Clean Air Act, um, making these things enforceable at the state level and federally enforceable are totally different than what these programs are typically used to experiencing. Um, and so it would be a nice hurdle to get over to not have to include those in a state plan as federally enforceable. The problem that states are identifying is that from EPA's perspective to not include them the state would be the one that would have to be enforced against. Um, and so that is a conundrum that we have to get past if we don't want to make uh, these type of demand side reductions when we include them in plans federally enforceable. Okay. So once we get over that big hurdle, <laughs> um, we've got t four general criteria and 12 components that uh, EPA has said, you got it, this is an approvable state plan. This is what we can approve and this is what was included in the proposal. The first thing is the state plan must contain enforceable measures that reduce EGU CO2 emissions. Um, and that word enforceable is, is kind of the scary word that, um, that we'll talk a little bit about in more detail. The enforceable measures must be projected to achieve the emissions performance equivalent to or better than the applicable state specific CO2 goal on the timeline equivalent to that of the emission guidelines. So in other words, the projected emission reductions have to actually take place over the time frame that EPA is giving us in the plan. So it can't be something that we could achieve 20 years from now. It has to be something that's going to be achieved within the time frame of the plan. And we'll actually have to demonstrate that and then report periodically that we're actually achieving those reductions. The third is that the EGU CO2 emission performance under the state plan must be quantifiable and verifiable. And we'll go into a little bit more detail about um, those particular things. Um, when you hear folks talk about, at least air regulators talk about um, emissions performance and, and the measures, you'll hear quantifiable, verifiable. You'll also hear the words non-duplicative and permanent. The non-duplicative and permanent portion gets picked up in the 12 components 
um, of the plan. And I won't go into graphic details about those because a lot of them are repeats of the general criteria, but the additive ones are non-duplicative and permanent. Um, and as we talk about enforceable, quantifiable, verifiable, <laughs> duplicative and non-permanent, I wanted to give you two different examples to think about. So let's say that in Tennessee, Vanderbilt University decided it was going to do an ASCO. And by doing an ASCO and doing upgrades on its facilities um, in, in the university complex, it could reduce its, uh, its demand for electricity by about 5% off of what it currently uses today. So just think about that. Think about that's the program that Vanderbilt wants to put in place, and they're willing to do a performance contract to do that. And then think about whether the state would come to them and say, hey, we want to actually use that for credit in our plan. The other option is, in addition to that, Vanderbilt thinks they can get additional 2% reduction from behavioral programs outside the context of the ESCOs. Um, and so when we talk about these different, different types of things that have to go in a state plan, think about how the state could engage with Vanderbilt about what it needs to put in the state plan for a 5% reduction from an ESCO based on things that are beginning, like energy efficiency upgrades and stuff that will be done at facilities, and then a 2% reduction from behavioral programs at the university. Last one is the state plan must include a process for state reporting of plan implementation at the level of the affected entity, and EPA is now using the term affected entity versus affected EGU, because affected EGU are the actual um, units at the plants. Affected entity is anything within the plan that there would be an enforceable measure that the state would have to be able to enforce against. So it could be TVA as owner of the affected EGUs, or it could be Vanderbilt University as the affected entity if we included an ESCO or a behavioral por uh, program portion in our state plan. Um, CO2 emission performance outcomes and implementation of correction, corrective measures if necessary. Corrective measures are also a term that um, is, is a little bit of a scary term when we start talking about what that actually means. <laughs> okay, so on demand side considerations alone, where we have enforceability of measures, I wanted to just talk a little bit about enforceability on the utility demand side and then other programs. Um, Karen did a great job of kind of explaining that when we think about in the utility space what utilities have had to do to kind of think about valuing and monitoring their energy efficiency space and what they've been able to do. Um, we're not every utility is doing it in the same way but they're all doing something. And, and they're doing a pretty good job of, of kind of valuing what those programs mean, what they can deliver, and, uh, and then the, the monitoring and um, evaluation and verification on the back side of those. So when we think about enforceability, we think, okay, if we've got some level of confidence in the way they're valuing those programs and the way they're measuring them, and these are also the utilities that own our affected EGUs, that's a pretty good it's a lower risk option to include in a state plan because there's a lot of things that align there, particularly in states with vertically integrated utilities. And the reason that is the case is because the utility with the affected EGU that's generating the power is also the same utility from a corporate perspective that is doing the demand side programs. And that's a great alignment from, from a regulator standpoint. Um, in TVA, we or in Tennessee with TVA, that is not the case. We have a non-vertically integrated utility where we have TVA that owns the energy or the electric generating units um, and we have their local power companies that are actually doing and implementing the demand side programs. Um, and they're on a spectrum of being engaged with TVA to a large extent but also implementing some programs and in designing, starting to design some programs on their own. And so our level of comfort with that will be how much we can know about what our confidence level is and what our enforceability um, for those local power companies to actually deliver on those programs are. Or I should say, what TVA's confidence <laughs> in their local power companies to deliver on those programs is. Now when we move in, as, as Karen explained, when we move into other program space, um, we have a lot more of a concern on not only just the, the, the quantification and how those programs have been valued and how they're being tracked, but we also, states have a real concern about how we can actually enforce 
or include enforceable measures against those particular parties. And this is the Vanderbilt University um, example. Uh, we have, if we included 5%, the value of 5% reduction from an ESCO in our plan, if it didn't come to fruition, how would we actually enforce and require Vanderbilt to deliver on that promise? Um, and if you think about that from an ESCO standpoint, and, and if you're, there are any lawyers in the room, you can think about how you balance risk in these type of transactions. If an ESCO is guaranteed the performance, then Vanderbilt may feel like, well, gosh, we have a guarantee, so we can guarantee. Um, and then there's a kind of a chain of guarantees that may give you a little bit more of a um, uh, kind of a, uh, you feel less risky by including it, um, but does the law, do you have an actual statutory provision or a regulatory provision that gives the state the requirement or the ability, the authority to enforce against Vanderbilt University? And that's a big question for, for states right now. Um, and then when you move over to the behavioral side and you think about, ooh, how do we even think about valuing that? How do we think about quantifying it? How do we think about measuring it? And, and then how do you enforce something like that? You can imagine Vanderbilt's comfort level with that might get a little more wary, and the state's comfort level with that might get a little bit more wary. Because we're talking about what actually folks would do in their dorm room or, or you know, how people treat the lights in the main buildings or things, some, something like that. Okay, so on the projection to achieve emission performance, um, this is really just, it gets into a little bit of what I was talking about with the examples, is valuing the demand side programs. How are they valued? Um, we ha we're having great conversations with TVA right now on really trying to understand how they value their energy efficiency programs. Um, they just completed their integrated resource plan. It actually shows over the next 20 years they're going to be growing their energy efficiency programs. And so state regulators are really um, interested in how did you actually value that when you inputted it into the IRP process? And is that valuing something that we can really kind of rely on? And then also, how are you going to grow it? And the confidence with program performance and time frame. OK. This is the, um, this is the, the really in the weeds stuff. Sorry about that. Um, but this is what air regulators think about, I, I promise. <laughs> I've, been in, I've been in long meetings with them on this. Um, so this gets to quantifiable and verifiable. Uh, and this is, you know, we think about it, again, in the utility versus the non-utility space. Our experience nationally has been in the utility space. Our confidence level goes up when we think about utility energy efficiency programs. Um, when we think about other programs, we think about where are they. Um, Tennessee's no different than California and some other states. When you start digging in to some of the DOE-funded programs in the state, you don't see the same level of um, rigor that we'd like to see when you think about tracking and, and measuring what those programs have delivered um, over time. And so, so that all becomes a concern. Um, the other added gems are that they, we have to demonstrate that uh, they're, they're non-duplicative and they're permanent. Non-duplicative means that they can't be used for any other state um, plan to, under the Federal Clean Air Act. And that's what I mean when I say there's no really any individual state plan. States have to talk to one another because our electric system goes beyond state borders. So if TVA is doing an energy efficiency program and they're running that program with their local power company in Clarksville, Tennessee, chances are that there may be an affected unit in Kentucky that's actually being impacted by that energy efficiency program. Kentucky's going to have an interest in that credit, but so is Tennessee as well. So the other thing is uh, reporting at the affected entity level. We're talking about a concept of reporting that we're very used to in the air context when it comes to our uh, regulated entities like TVA. They're very used to reporting. The kind of reporting we're talking about now in energy efficiency programs gets a little more rigorous than what they may be used to. Um, so that's, that's a different level we're talking about. And then one last thing, corrective measures. Um, again, EPA in the proposal said the triggering event and time frame is going to be important. They're looking at ten, when, when a state may be measuring 10% actuals above projected. That means if we get to a compliance point and our actual emissions are 10% above what we projected, um, then we have to think about how are we going to put corrective measures in, who are we going to enforce those corrective measures in. And the consequences, EPA took comment on a variety of them. Do you just have corrective measures in your plan? 
Do we give you a whole new plan revision with new measures? Do we require you as a little bit of a penalty to do additional emission reductions because you couldn't get what you thought you could get on the front end? Or do we do like a uh, SIP call um, and do we do require you to do a new plan um, by implementing an entirely new SIP and going through that process again? Sorry I went over a little bit.